This episode is sponsored by Podcast Movement 2016, coming to Chicago in July. Stick around for more information on how you can be part of Podcast Movement 2016. You're listening to the Podcast Movement Festival. What's a podcast again? A podcast is... Talk. Just hang on. Podcast. It all has to do with the same thing. It's content and delivery and exciting people through sound. You're listening to Podcast Movement Sessions. I'm Brian Orr, and today we're going to be hearing from Nikki Silva of the Kitchen Sisters. Now, the Kitchen Sisters are Nikki Silva and her longtime partner, Davian Nelson. They've been making radio for years, well before podcasting, but now they're producing the Fugitive Waves podcast together, which is part of the Radiotopia family. When I went into Podcast Movement 2015, I knew that going to the session with Nikki was going to be one of my highest priorities because she truly is an expert at making phenomenal stories. So I got to sit in on her session, which is great, which you will hear, but afterwards, I was going back to my hotel room, and she was on the same floor as me. She was entering her, her hotel room, and of course, me being a creepy fanboy, I walked up to her and said, Nikki, and she turned around, and I said, hi, I'm Brian, blah, blah, blah. And then I said, you know, I really enjoy your work, and she responded, oh, that's great. Have you ever cut tape? Which was not a question I was expecting. Now, obviously, I know in the professional sense, cutting tape, the, that was the old style of editing, but in that moment, I, I had to answer the question, and I said, yes. And I wasn't lying because when she asked that question, I remembered when I was 10, 11 years old, I had this little recorder and I used to make little radio dramas with my friend and my brother and I would cut the tape and and like edit it that way and tape it back together and listen to it again. So funny that she asked the question, but it actually reminded me of something that I did as a kid. I talked to Nikki and that was one of the first things I asked her about is, you know, what was it like collecting and editing back before the digital systems that we have nowadays for editing. We used to go out with a cassette tape recorder. It was a very big cassette tape recorder. It was an old Sony. And we'd gather tape, and then we'd come back, and we would transfer the tape from our little cassette player to uh, -to reel-to-reel tape. In other words, we'd record it from the cassette onto the reel-to-reel tape, quarter-inch tape. And then we would listen and it's very much like editing it's because they took all of it from from the old school actually working in tape that when you work on the computer in pro tools or hindenburg or uh, garage band or whatever a lot of that is kind of even the way everything is laid out and it looks it's kind of like when you're cutting tape you put your cursor down now and you make an edit mark and then you go along and you make the other end of the edit mark and you take out that piece of sound in the middle. And that's very much like it was with the actual reel-to-reel tape. But we'd use a razor blade. First you'd, first you'd listen and you would mark the first, you know, the, where you wanted to start your edit. You'd take your grease pencil and you'd make a little line physically onto the tape. And then you'd listen until it was time to stop. And you'd take your reels back and forth and listen for that silent spot in between so you wouldn't be cutting off a word. And then you'd make another cut mark, put it onto uh, into a little groove that had a, a place for your razor blade to cut right through. You'd cut that tape and you'd physically take out the piece you didn't want. And then you'd take a little tiny piece of scotch tape and you'd tape it back together. It was actually really fun and very tactile and very much like sculpture or I don't know. It was it was fun. And in fact, Davia just cries because she so misses uh, working on reel-to-reel tape. I mean, she really liked that process. I did too. But it's it's uh, it's been kind of uh, interesting to see the similarities and the dissimilarities with editing on uh, the computer. I, you know, it's not quite as fun. <laughs> but then it was a lot more work to do it the old way too, because then you'd have your cut up tape and you'd have to have um, one reel with your, let's say you've got someone telling a story, you've got your story on one reel, and let's say you want to put some music underneath it, you'd have another tape recorder with the music 
And then you would be playing both of those into a mixing board and you would mix those two together and you would ride the levels and make sure everything was just right. So it's it's very different from now when you can have multiple tracks in a uh, very simply in an editing program on your computer. We used to, you know, you've got these pieces of tape and you'd want to move one from one part to another part. So we used to kind of write little codes on the on the tape so we would remember what it was and we'd have a reel that we would put all of those selects on and then we'd go back in and find the right spot for them into the main reel Uh, so it was it was pretty time consuming look around your daily life there's a little piece of thomas edison almost everywhere your desk lamp that x-ray you got when you broke your arm the battery in your car the movie you saw last night. The recording of this story that you're about to hear. From PRX, Radiotopia. Thomas Edison, the near-deaf inventor of the phonograph, was the first to capture what he called fugitive sound waves. I am the Edison phonograph, created by the great wizard of the new world. Delightful... Edison may have invented the talking machine, But in order to hear the music coming out of it, he had to bite on the edge of his phonograph so the music would vibrate through his jawbone. When you go to visit his house in New Jersey, look for the teeth marks on the edge of his piano. Good evening. This is Admiral. Sorry, your friend. The bear with that new 19... Welcome to Fugitive Waves. Are you aware of the installation of any listening devices? Lost recordings, shards of sound along with new tales of remarkable people from around the world. I also got a letter from Amy. Stories from the flip side of history. Hi, everybody. (laughs) That was Davia. And I'm conjuring her here with me today because I, she, would, she really wanted to come, but her dad's ill, and so here I am without her. But she's in the room. Uh, Davy and I started doing a live radio show on a small community station in Santa Cruz, California, over 30 years ago. What I'm finding really very exciting about right now, and especially being here at the uh, podcast Uh, movement festival, I'm calling it a festival, not a conference, is that it's really a lot like when we first started out, I feel, in community radio. Uh, The mood and the spirit and the energy and the issues are all very much the same to me. Um, The world seemed wide open. In your presentation, you said, uh, I call it the podcast movement festival, not the conference. So tell me a little bit about what that word means to you, because there's something dear to you in that word. Yeah, I I think festival is the perfect the perfect word for it. I mean, we're all coming together and sharing all of these ideas. And I think of a conference, I think of something kind of um, staid and Uh, technical and um, you know in this festival I thought everybody was just having a great time and and learning a lot from each other and uh, I loved kind of the excitement of it and the newness of it I think that to me is the difference between festival and conference. Davia and I had never heard of NPR it didn't air in our area there were no rules that we knew of it was kind of like the wild west like now in podcasting, and it's being created as we speak. So I think one of the big things is the time constraints. No time constraints and no rules and no money for most of us and a lot of passion. And the other thing is we're speaking directly to our community, which we were doing back then too in community radio and developing a devoted listenership. We started out like many podcasters today, working in this little closet. It was a radio station. It was right on the beach. It was teeny, tiny. And the signature sound of the station was we'd dangle the microphone out over the railing of the porch and record the surf lapping on the beach. And that would just kind of play in the background throughout. And we had this two-hour show every Tuesday. It was a really eclectic mix of music and call-ins and live interviews with filmmakers and politicians and Italian grandmothers and anyone who captured our ear. We were possessed 
by oral history. We traveled around our region recording just about anything that moved. We'd come home with hours and days of tape, and even though we loved every minute of it, we quickly realized that no one was going to listen to this but us. So we gradually taught ourselves to cut tape and with a razor blade and bits of scotch tape, and we began to create, you know, kind of what we imagined. I don't know what we were thinking, but we, little sound movies, and we would embed them in our in our show, and we were really just kind of entertaining ourselves and getting excited about all the possibilities. One of the earliest inspirations for our work came out of my dad's garage in Oakland. He was a pack rat, Ernie's garage. It was notorious. He had everything you could ever want or imagine in there. And deep in the far back one day, he unearthed two cardboard boxes labeled Mom's 78s that he thought would be great for our show. So I went up there and I hauled these boxes back to Santa Cruz and Davy and I kind of rifled through them and it was a treasure trove of old jazz records. And somewhere in between Ella Fitzgerald and Hoagie Carmichael, we found this. Hello, Louie. This is your wife again. To start off, honey, I want to tell you I love you very much. This week I've received no mail from you yet but I was a lucky gal last week. I got seven. Today, I also got a letter from Emil. And his P.S., he said, we ski in 43. I sure hope so. See, Lou, I hope so, too. Well, we got a big record this time. We heard, too, pretty soon that they're not going to make any more of these records, so I've bought up as many as I can so I can at least send one every month for you. Maybe I'll sing a song for you, too, honey. Won't that be swell? Um, what else? Oh. Listen, you, stay out of those pubs and away from those barmaids. Tell me some more about what you're doing instead of... You don't tell me very much in your letters. How's the dancers, Pop? Do they jitterbug there, honey? I bet they don't dance as nice as we do. Though. This is for you, Louie. Fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly. I've gotta love a man. The record went on for about, I don't know, three or four minutes on the side, and Davy and I were just blown away. I mean, who was Mrs. B? I mean, who was she? And who was Louie? And my dad had no idea. We had no idea. We searched for her for years and never found her. But there was something about her voice and about her intonation and the pauses and the air in the room. It was such an audio time capsule from World War II. We became obsessed, and we began asking everybody we knew about home recordings. And these discs were out there, forgotten, lost, hidden away in people's attics and stereo consoles in the record bins at Goodwill. We found so many voices, little windows into history. My mom even made one. She went down to the local radio station in Oakland, and they recorded her talking to my dad. And they sent the record to him overseas. He carried it around France with him throughout the whole war and brought it back home, my mom's voice. It was the Louis letter and all these other home recordings that we found that later inspired our series Lost and Found Sound that we did on NPR with Jay Allison. It was celebrating the millennium, chronicling how recorded sound shaped and captured the 20th century. We opened up a phone line, and thousands of people called in telling us about recordings and stories of people possessed by sound, crowdsourcing before there was a name for it. Thomas Edison came up quite a bit, that driven, eccentric, passionate genius who invented the first talking machine. Edison kind of set the stage for all these other guys and women who came out of the woodwork with this project, and he was an experimenter, a tinkerer. To make his early sound recordings, he had performers shout into a large cone. The cone funneled the sound waves down to a diaphragm that vibrated a stylus that cut into a rotating wax cylinder. No microphones, no amps, just powered by sound waves. The best way to get the full sense of a person's sound quality or tone is you have to have not only your mouth, but your nose, your whole head in that horn. You're literally sticking your head into a black hole. Edison made a horn that was 125 feet long, and it went from one building where the recording machine was, outdoors, 
to another building 125 feet away that was the recording studio, you know, where the musicians would come in. His idea was that it took sound waves 125 feet before they would untangle themselves. This is needle 100 dash 50 dash B1. If he did 8,000 experiments and none of them worked, most people would be discouraged at the money spent and the time lost. And he would simply say, I now know 8,000 ways that this doesn't work. Edison's factory burned down in December of 1914. He picked up a photograph of himself that had been found in the fire, and it had been charred all around, and his face was in the center. And his face was not burned, and he scrawled on it. Didn't touch me, right on the picture. And that picture survives. The next day, he was you know, in the papers, appealing to people for chemicals and lines of credit. Within uh, weeks, he was uh, issuing records again. It didn't floor him at all. All right, let me let you in on a little secret here. It's between you and me. Chicago? Have you ever heard of WBEZ in Chicago? Yeah, they produce a little podcast that we like to call This American Life. Well, I'm not saying that if you come to Podcast Movement 2016 in Chicago that you will become best friends with Ira Glass, but I'm not not saying it. I mean, it can't hurt your chances, right? Anyway, so Podcast Movement 2016, Chicago, Illinois, in July. Go to podcastmovement.com to pick up your tickets. You're going to want to follow Podcast Movement at Podcast Movement on Twitter because there's going to be all kinds of crazy announcements about amazing speakers. There's like going to be over 100 of them. Right now, it's headlined by Anna Sale of Death, Sex, and Money. She's already announced that she's going to be there, and there'll be some other cool people there too. I can't name names, but the name might rhyme with... Just kidding. I'm not going to do that. Podcastmovement.com. Most of our stories come from talking to people, and we had just come up with the idea for the Lost and Found Sound series. And Davia, Davia is also a casting agent. She works in movies sometimes, and she was in Memphis working on a Francis Ford Coppola movie, um, Rainmaker. So she's a casting director, and she's looking for people. She's standing next to this guy who has great hair. So she kind of launches into a conversation with him about music and food. And then she starts talking, saying it out loud, all about our Lost and Found Sounds series. And the guy says, he just starts to crack up, and he goes, you got to come meet my dad. And he goes, and I think you're going to want to meet my mom, too. And it turns out his dad was Sam Phillips, the man who first recorded Elvis Presley, Howlin' Wolf, Johnny Cash, and so many groundbreakers in sound. And his mom turned out to be Becky Phillips of WHER the first all-girl radio station in the nation, started in 1955 by Sam Phillips. And when Sam sold Elvis's contract, he used the money to start WHER. Good morning. This is WHER Radio, America's first all-girl radio station, Memphis, Tennessee. WHER 1430 kilocycles with full power of 1,000 watts as authorized by the Federal Communications Commission, Washington, D.C. We cordially invite you to stay tuned to WHER Radio all day, every day. We signed on October the 29th, 1955. The thing was nobody knew that we were going to be all girl. Each girl thought she was going to be the only girl on the radio station. Dottie Abbott who I hired as general manager, I told Dottie, and she almost shouted, I don't believe you, Sam. I know you're crazy, but you're not that crazy. You know, I mean, she was just beside herself. You were invading man's territory. I mean, you were supposed to be a guest or something if you're going to do anything as a woman on radio. This is WHER Radio, America's first all-girl radio station for sparkling... I'm Sam Phillips, and I'd wanted a radio station all my life. Radio, to me, it's, it's a living thing. Sam Phillips was best known for Sun Records, um, but before Sun Records, before WHER and Elvis, 
in order to fund his passion of recording black and white musicians coming out of the fields and tiny towns of the South. Like so many of us in this room, he had to take on other work to help pay the bills. He was broke. So he started Memphis Recording Service. His motto, we record anything, anywhere, anytime. Weddings, funerals, marching bands, talent shows, bar mitzvahs. <laughs> he recorded everything. So he could come back to Memphis Recording Service and record B.B. King by night and Ike Turner and Carl Perkins. And then he'd hit the road trying to get his records played by DJs and radio stations all over the South, trying to get his numbers up. He was a man possessed. I was on the road for 65,000 miles a year, sleeping in YMCA's. It was two-lane highway. I learned every back road from Little Rock to Dallas and through Shreveport. Get back here, auditioning, recording, mastering. Sam would leave a lot to promote his records, and we only had really one car. So when he went on the road to um, get um, Alan Wolf played or get Little Junior Parker played or get Elvis played, He'd be gone, and, and so if Jerry and I, my brother, wanted to go somewhere, we would ride the bus. I can remember going to Goldsmith's department store. It was really the first time that I had ever seen a water fountain that said, colored only. But you'd go from that eight or ten blocks away where Memphis Recording Service was to Sam recording Roscoe Gordon or the prisoners who were prisoners at a maximum security prison in Nashville singing Just Walking in the Rain. I can remember being there, seeing the, the guards with all their regalia in the back of the studio. I mean, I'm a little boy here. I'm eight years old or something. Just walking in the rain And I was as busy as a one-armed paper hanger man with a lot of paste, you know, to put on the wall. It was 20 hours a day sometimes. I got out and weighed 124 pounds and even had a nervous breakdown. And, and, and this is truth. And I came back up in the middle of 51 after spending weeks in a psychiatric hospital taking electric shock treatments. I was totally mentally exhausted because I had such an absolute belief in what I was doing. I just thought that was a small price to pay. So many people almost view audio, especially commercially, as almost like a segue into video nowadays. Like, oh, well, you do audio, but eventually you'll get into video kind of a thing. But what makes audio special to you? Oh, you know, it's the theater of the imagination, which I'm sure I'm ripping off from someone who said that about something else. But um, it, it just, it, it isn't the same. A lot of times, you know, Davia will do the interview with someone and and then I'll do the editing and I've never seen the person I wasn't there to sort of see the whole place the way it was laid out or anything and I just build this entire world up in my mind and um and and I just have to laugh a lot of times when I see what the reality of it was if I see some photographs or if I meet the person uh that I've been cutting for weeks you know and I love that. I mean, I, I love that my mind is, is doing all that work and bringing all that to the story and reading into it and really listening to what's being said and, instead of being distracted by the reality of it all or by the visuals or by how someone looks. I love film. Film is kind of the way I got into all this. I wanted to be a filmmaker in the beginning and made some films, but I did move this way and it's kind of interesting to me the ease of it the simplicity of of interviewing someone they don't feel so self-conscious when you're when you just have a microphone and and if you do things right if you hold the microphone properly which you should below their eyesight I mean they kind of forget about it whereas with with film there's it's the special person that kind of 
can really sit there and talk to you in an intimate way and have the camera on them. And and I feel like there's something about the voice, you know, there's something very real and deep and it's it's hearing is the first sense that we experience, you know, in the womb. And, and it's probably, they say, the last thing before we die, you know, is, is hearing. That's the one we keep and, and have from the start. And I, I just think it's, uh, it's a very profound sense. Um, and, and there's so much you can do with it and so many ways you can put it together with music and sound to create an entire visual. I mean, I feel like Davy and I often say this, we feel like we're making little movies in our work. And we go to a lot of work to make these little audio movies, but I think that they're special and and different than if we'd be making if if we do the same story in in uh, in video or film. It's um it's a different story. It's a different medium and an equal medium to film. Before the tape recorder, there was bone music, at least in the Soviet Union. We were doing a story about the impact of the kitchen on life in Russia during the Soviet Union era. And during Stalin's time, most people in Moscow lived in communal apartments, like 10 and 15 families sharing one apartment, one kitchen, one bathroom, no privacy. And then Nikita Khrushchev came in, and he built these enormous apartment buildings with tiny little apartments in them, and they had tiny little kitchens. But these kitchens became these hot spots of, for culture because it was the first time people could get together with their friends without being afraid of the KGB. And they were places where food, vodka, politics was debated, and forbidden books and music were shared. And they were called dissident kitchens. They took these used x-rays, okay, with bones, pictures of bones on them and skulls, and they had no acetate, and vinyl was very rare and expensive in the Soviet Union, and they made these bootleg records right onto this acetate with the grooves, and they're absolutely beautiful artifacts on, and on top of being incredible things to listen to, and you can hear Elvis on bone, they call it. A lot of our stories have come from the hidden world of libraries, museums, and archives. And one time we were doing research at the Rogers and Hammerstein archives at Lincoln Center. And right as we were leaving, we asked archivist Donald McCormick about the lost sounds in his archive. You know, what's in there that no one knows about but you? And that's when he pulled out the eight cardboard acetate discs made by Tennessee Williams and his lover Poncho at a penny arcade in New Orleans in 19... 1947. 6A5. Princess interview. The speakers are Tennessee Williams and Poncho. This is Vanilla Williams uh, interviewing Princess Rodriguez, who just arrived here from Monterey. Princess, what do you have to say about the trade here in this town? Now, have you gotten around much yet? Oh, yes, I have, Vanilla. I have gotten around. I've been cruising on Canal Street, you know. Oh, honey, you get off Canal Street. Miss Canal Street is no good. You should get on Miss Royal or Miss Bourbon. You should get up to the Personality Bar. This is the place for you girls. The Personality Bar? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Princess Rodriguez, you get your ass up to the <laughs> Personality Bar. Poncho had a sense of humor, Tennessee being a sexual minority, and Poncho being a Mexican, they both took their look at society as being preposterous in many ways. Poncho was given to temper tantrums, apparently. And on one occasion, when he was angry with Tennessee, and Tennessee was gone, went into the closet with with scissors and cut up all of Tennessee's clothes. At that time, when Tennessee met him, he was writing the play, Streetcar Named Desire. And in Pancho, he had a a kind of a role model of the character that he would eventually create in Stanley Kowalski. And uh, because of Pancho's dominance over him, he was playing out the role of Blanche Dubois. Even the thing about the kindness of strangers, that famous line, came out of uh, Tennessee having said you bring strangers into our house. Poncho's reply to that was, some of my best friends were strangers. Tennessee Williams, when did you get there? Over the 30 years we've been working together, Davy and I have amassed a kind of accidental archive of voices and stories. Thousands of hours of tape on almost every recording medium imaginable. 
There's so much dead media to contend with, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and cassette players and mini-disc players. What we're loving about podcasting is that it's bringing things full circle for us back to the live radio days, experimenting, using our voices, mining our archives. We're off the clock. We can take the time to explore the side roads, to tell some of the backstories we tell our friends at the dinner table. In one episode that we did, um, to get to the main story of the piece, we meander through the neighborhoods of North Beach, where our office is, into the sounds of the Green Street Mortuary Band, which is an Italian marching band that marches for the Chinese funerals all through Chinatown, which is fabulous. And then we stop off, and Lawrence Ferlinghetti reads the poem that he wrote about the marching band. And then we kind of wind up at City Lights Bookstore, where we see a book in the window. And that's kind of where the story begins. The book was titled Patti Smith, 1969 to 1976. Paging through it, we discovered that Judy had not only photographed Patti, she'd also made little Super 8 movies as the two young women created a world together. The movies were missing, but the soundtracks remained. Lost and found sound, we thought. Gotta get those recordings. Gotta meet that photographer. And we did. Fugitive Waves, episode number seven, Just Girls, the hidden world of Patti Smith and Judy Lynn. Is it on? Yeah. What do I do now? <laughs> um, Patti Smith and Judy Lynn. <laughs> well, I'm Judy Lynn. I'm a photographer. I've just published this book, Photographs of Patti Smith, 1969 to 1976. Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. Patty and I met because we were both in Brooklyn. We met through our boyfriends, Peter Barnowski and Robert Maplethorpe. We went to Patty and Robert's apartment. Patty was in the kitchen cooking spaghetti sauce, and she didn't really talk to us. And Robert showed us drawings he had done. He'd been at Coney Island that day, and he'd taken off this kind of huge piece of skin from his sunburn. He was going to use it in a drawing. We were all admiring this huge piece of skin that he peeled off. <coughs> Is it okay if I take my shoes and socks off? It'll be real neat. Then I can show you the ankle bracelet I got on that says Brian Jones, and I always wear it. I found a cassette Patty and I made in 1969. We were making an eight millimeter movie in my tenement apartment in Brooklyn. And unfortunately, I lost the movie, but I did somehow save this tape she made. All right, what do you want me to do? Look at me. Turn around and go back and look at the wall again. Oh, okay. Are these clothes okay? Well, I mean, do you, do you want me to put anything special on or ugly on? My name is Patty Smith, and I was born December 30th in Chicago, Illinois. And um, I was born 6.04 in the morning. Um, the people like I hold tribute to, I was like um, Sonia Henney, I used to like Dakunin. I still like I look, still like Sag Harbor Woman. Most of all, I like the Rolling Stones. I'm sorry Brian Jones died. Um, is it okay to come down? I think that we could do this was really about being kids and playing dress up and playing. Oh look, I can be a princess. Oh look, I can be a Godard heroine. And by taking a photograph and isolating things, it could look like it was more than it actually was. We weren't really dreaming a future, we were dreaming a present. Want to try one in color? Yeah. All these films will be like a story. <laughs> I'd love to be a rock and roll star. Huh? Good genius to be a rock and roll star. I wonder what's happening with the tape recorder. <laughs> Are you recording stuff? Yeah, I'm recording everything. I'm recording everything, she says. I love that line. Two girls experimenting in a Brooklyn apartment, finding their voice. Summon the elders is another one of the Kitchen Sisters mantras. We we're building this on many shoulders. The inventors, the artists, the storytellers who have come before. It's unclear what device, what brain implant will come next, but certainly something will. Sound is the first sense we experience as a human tucked away in the womb, and they say it's our hearing that is the last to go. 
It's beyond the device or the delivery method. It's about the story and the music and the power of a person's voice. In closing, the last words go to Sam Phillips. He passed on 12 years ago this week. I love conjuring him in this room. I think he would have been a bold podcaster. There is nothing even close to being as intimate as a person's voice. There's not. I mean, even the picture of a person, listen to this, talking about sound, that to me lets you in to the soul world. You get to feel the heartbeat of that person. As we go into the 21st century and get on down the line, it is totally amazing what you can do with sound and how it has changed the face of this earth. That's the only reason I hate to actually exit this uh, planet. <laughs> I, I had to take that trip. One of these days, I could take sound and stop these damn wars. It's just got to be God's best creation was sound in my opinion. Memphis Recording Service, we record anything, anywhere, anytime. This brings us to the close of Nikki's talk at Podcast Movement 2015, but I found out something about Nikki when I was uh, researching her, and turns out she lives in a commune, which I kind of have something in common with her. Growing up, I had a family of 12 who actually lived with us in our house for long periods of time, and uh, I, my wife comes from a family of 12 as well, so I'm used to these enormous groups of people. I felt that common bond with Nikki on that. So I asked her about the commune and what that's like and what that's all about. In 1979, a group of us got together and we weren't trying to create any special kind of cult or we didn't have dietary restrictions or anything that we believed in uh, as a group. But we did want sort of the same thing, which was a good place to live and a beautiful place to live and an affordable place to live. So we pooled our money and we found a piece of property that at the time seemed really, really out of our reach. And it would have been if we'd acted by ourselves. But we pooled our resources and we bought a piece of property, took out individual loans to pay the down payment at the time, and and then just began paying the monthly payments, which turned out to be about what we were pay- we would have been paying in rent anyway. And there were eight of us at the beginning. There's three families here now that live on the property. We've been here since the beginning. We've raised kids here. I think the secret to it all has been, there's two things, the architecture and eating together every night. Um, I think we have a big main house that's about 50 by 50, and we have a big main, uh, kind of main kitchen, and th- then we have individual sleeping houses. And the individual sleeping houses don't have kitchens. They have a half bath. They don't have their own shower. So they were very inexpensive to build, relatively speaking. And the main house has a beautiful big kitchen, kind of an industrial restaurant style kitchen. And uh, one of our partners is an architect designer who's designed a lot of kitchens for restaurants. And you know, he was very strong on this sort of stainless steel, very, which is now very popular. But at the time, you know, I was kind of, you know, crying about wanting my little tablecloths and curtains and things. But it turned out that he was so right to have this big, beautiful, very functional kitchen. And there's a dish room where you can shove the dirty, dirty dishes in there. And then the person who cooks does the dish in it, dishes at night and sort of takes care of all the mess and you never have dishes in the sink. So there's all sorts of architectural details like that that I think really made it work. And the privacy of having your own space and then being able to go into the communal space when you want to be with people uh, and to eat every night. And the eating is key. I mean, we found out early on that 
we can't have meetings because all we do is fight. So we sort of dropped the meeting idea and we have dinner. We have dinner every night. And yeah, sometimes we fight at dinner. It's like everybody and it's like every family. But, you know, you have to be there the next night to either cook or eat and things just get worked out. And there's just a lot of trust, obviously, that's grown up over the years. And we definitely know how to push each other other's buttons if we want to. But uh, overall, I would say the good has very much outweighed any issues and um, hardships. Uh, it's, it's, it's been wonderful and it's been great to raise kids this way. All of our kids want to do the same thing. You know, they're all sort of trying to look for land and figure out how they can do something similar. It's been a, it's been a good thing. It's interesting that you mentioned that your kids want to do the same thing because that's kind of the ultimate litmus test, I guess, for uh, for whether or not something worked if they experienced it and want the same for them and their their families. Well, that was kind of interesting because, you know, all every one of them when they went off to college, all, well, the four girls that grew up here, and then there's two older kids too that were here um, from the beginning, but they were a little bit older, but the four girls who were born here and raised here, all of them wrote their college essays about growing up this way in a communal living situation. And, uh, and then they all came home. They were all uh, sort of off in various places and they all came home for some holiday or another and went up to San Francisco and they came back (laughs) <laughs> they'd all gotten a tattoo in the same script that said commune and uh, various parts of their bodies, depending on their personalities. But um, <laughs> it, it was, it was, you know, it was really, I, I, I'm not terribly into tattoos personally. I, I like them on people other than my children, but I have to say I was very touched by um, the commune tattoo and uh, have even considered going for it myself at some point. The only request that I have is that if you do go for the commune tattoo, that I would be given an opportunity to do an audio documentary on that process because that sounds really interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that would so shock our girls, I'll tell you, if we... If we got uh, commune tattoos. I'm going to have to build up to that one, but I will let you know. All right, I want to give a special thanks to some people who left us reviews on iTunes. That's always so appreciated, and uh, the great reviews we got actually landed us on the front page of iTunes, which is pretty pretty stinking awesome. So I want to thank Bill Nowicki, Alex Harris, Daniel Bowling, Amy Robles, Melissa Wilson, Jessica Rhodes, Jeff Brown, Tony Elam, Tim Page, my good friend Fred Dews, Joe Pardo, Daryl Darnell, and then always I want to thank Jared and Dan. They are the ones who made this awesome conference in the first place as well as just thanking Nikki for how generous she was with me and even sharing the commune story with me. That was pretty cool of her to do that. So if you would be willing to leave us a rating and review on iTunes, that would be super cool of you too, but I think you're super cool anyway. So I'll see you next Monday. Monday.